Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Boris Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the explosion at a mine in Iran, killing countless mine workers, and also about the abysmal situation of workers in that country. Our interview is with Fozia Elias, the brilliant activist from uh, um, Atheist and Agnostic Alliance of Pakistan. Our fatwa that's insane of this week is about how universities should become mosques. Say what? And the slice of life is of a whim, women in Kuwait walking for women in Saudi Arabia and against male guardianship rules. Don't go away. Stay with us. In Iran recently, uh, there has been an explosion at one of the mines, coal mines, in the north of Iran, in Golestan. And uh, what's happened so far is we know that over 20 uh, miners have, had, uh, have died, their bodies have been handed over to their families, but there's many more missing and obviously presumed dead. And of course, it's such a huge human tragedy and such a loss. And of course, we know that what's happened here is just the tip of the iceberg of the situation of miners and workers in general in Iran, yeah, I isn't mean, it's it? It's highlighted the plight of the working people and miners in particular and the working people. There's lack of complete safety and security for uh, working class who are actually, you know, taking part in really, really dangerous um, activity, dang dangerous conditions. This is, you, com you, you put this aside that there's no responsibility. The, you know, the, the, the inspectors were in the mine day before and passed it to safety. They did not shut down the mine. And, and this is even though the workers were complaining, were complaining about... for a long time about the smell of gas, yeah. methane, and the and these, not only that, there's no safety equipment. When they're trying to get the uh, to the trap miners, there were not even oxygen mask for them mm. to go down and, and rescue the workers. But that's actually highlighted the issue. The same mine workers hadn't been paid between eight to nine months. I mean, imagine can, can the you situation. imagine not getting your salary for eight to nine months and also given the conditions that they're working in? And of course, this is not something that's specific to them. Many of the strikes in Iran and the protests in Iran are linked to you know, unpaid, unpaid wages, wages, isn't it? For, for many months as well as very low wages. I mean, the, the statistics is that uh, the minimum wage is one third of the poverty line in that country and millions of people uh, who are working are living under the poverty 12, 12 line. 12 million, I think it's at, or 20 um, million. Well, it's, you know, the, the numbers vary. The government says one thing, uh, yeah. but in reality, people say it's actually 50 million people are living yeah. under the poverty line. And, and the issue is that um, uh, when you looked at the um, 1st of May International Workers' mm. Day celebrations and, and protests, majority of the protests and demands were for unpaid wages and this is not just the private companies and privatized companies the government institutions and government employees are not paid yeah. this is a condition that the slum and islamism creates for working people and some you of know. the other uh, demands is of obviously uh, the release of uh, jailed um, labor activists you know the right to association and organization the right to strike they're illegal in iran and uh, very often, uh, labor activists are charged with yeah, sec security, security crimes. You know, yeah, I mean, exactly. th 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 this is very interesting because um, this goes hand in hand with the lack of any rights and really, really bad working condition in Iran. He's, that's why they, uh, anybody who protests, they say you are committing a crime against the security of Islam and nation and put them and, and jail them and flog them and that so you put that together you could see the role of Islam and Islamism in power and also very and long creates... long term prison sentences yeah, for yeah. anything from five to eleven years yeah. for organizing a May Day rally or for protesting you know unpaid wages and things like that and of course the good news is one of the um, 
uh, Labour uh, leaders, Behnam Ibrahim Zadeh, was yeah. recently released after six years in prison. He was kept one year longer than he was uh, meant to be kept in prison. And of course, we have other uh, Labour leaders, including Abdi, yeah, uh, who, who's a, with the Teachers Association. His name is Ismail Abdi, who's been sentenced to six years for yeah. colluding against the state, uh, again, for fighting for teachers' rights. Yes. So, you know, it's important to uh, put the, um, uh, you know, floodlight actually on the condition of the working class in Iran and and the mind um, uh, the recent mine uh, uh, the mine the explosion in the mine in Iran actually highlights a lot of these issues unpaid wages lack of security imprisonment of the workers who protest and object to the working condition that's life on the Islamic Republic yeah, so of Iran solidarity itself. with the working class in Iran is key how can some left organizations defend the Islamic regime of Iran as a regime that is pro working class uh, absolutely shocking and outrageous you know, it's it's anti-working class, anti-human uh, rights in all aspects, and it's uh, something that needs to be opposed. Pressure needs to be put on to release the jailed workers and to stand with uh, the demands of workers in Iran, which includes, you know, a rise in minimum wage, better, safer working conditions, payment of unpaid wages, and the right to strike an association. Bozia Elias, it's a great pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to speak to you about your own experiences, why you left Islam. Uh, basically, I'm, I belong to a very religious family. Uh, if I see on my background that my father and my mother, they are very, very religious. And I was also very religious before my marriage. When I was uh, 15, it was really forcedly marriage by my father. And uh, after my first marriage, I get to know that there is nothing real. I mean, only fairy tales. And we are really forced to do the things. We are not concerned, those things. We have to pray for five times a day. And I was asked by my father, even by my husband, that I have to cover my head. I am not allowed to come in front of any stranger, even I was not allowed to talk to my own friends. I mean, my life was really stuck and stopped after my marriage. It was such a, a bad uh, experience for me because I never uh, thought about it. I have many thoughts in my uh, mind that I will do this, I will do this, and I will achieve something in my life. But after my marriage, I experienced it it was really worse for me. I was really forced and I was really tortured by my husband. And he really beat me over not uh, uh, covering my head. He always told me, don't speak with strange person, don't come in front of my cousins as well, and uh, don't talk to your uh, uh, friends. And before marriage, I was told to by my, uh, by my father and my friends because I was really a school-going girl when I was married. And I was told that marriage is such a nice thing, very beautiful thing. And I will get a lot of uh, new dresses, jewelry, and shoes. But it was not like this. And my friends, they used to say that you, you can have your own house after marriage. But it was nothing like that. I mean, I had such a bad experience with, the, with this. So I asked many times to Allah, that why my husband is beating me with no reason, why he is torturing me by every day. So I, I just changed my mind and I thought, and there was no answer, Mariam. I asked Allah very, very times, you know, every night I cry and I ask him for help. But there was no solution. If I mean, if there is really Allah, then why he was not listening to me? Why he was giving more and more power to my husband and he was beating to me with no reason? So then I decided, I thought, no, it is only mistake of my mind. Actually, there is no Allah, no supreme power. How can a supreme power allow to a person to beat a woman or anyone with no reason? So that's why I just left Islam.
Some people will say you just had a bad husband. It's got nothing to do with Allah or Islam. What would you say to that? Uh, yes, he, he was also like this. I admit that he has no respect for women and I don't know what is his history and what is his background. I, I really don't know. I don't know. But, Mariam, this is such a common sense. If you are really a nice human being, you can have learned something about humanity and you know your basic rights. You can treat others equally. It has, I mean, it has nothing to do with Islam or it has nothing to do with any religion. This is common sense. So he must have to treat not only me, but others also. So yes, I must say that there is nothing to do with religion and nothing to do with all, all Islam and other things. So this is the, I, I mean, this is, if I say, I must say, this is the Islam who give powers to man to beat women. Because it is written in Quran that man is superior than woman and woman is really inferior. And you can beat your wives. I mean, how can a supreme power could give a power to the man? We are also human beings. Women are also human beings. But they have no respect for us. What happened when you decided to leave Islam? What happened to you? Uh, it was such a, a big step for me in my life. I had suffered a lot in my life. At that time, uh, when I got married, I was 15 years old. Uh, at the age of 17, I had a child, the baby girl. She's not with me. But yes, after uh, declaring that I don't believe anymore on Islam, I paid a lot. I mean, I was rejected by my family. They disowned me. I asked my father many times to help me regarding this issue, which was going on in between me and my husband. But he always said, no, this is your personal matter. Once you are married, you are married. And you have nothing to do with us now. Your husband is your master. Just do whatever he wants to do. Yeah and just go and obey him. What happened to me, actually, my father, my whole family, they disowned me. And uh, I also had to flee my country because now I'm living in Holland. And uh, the really bad thing to me is I had to leave my daughter. I mean, I was forced to leave her because my ex-husband, he had custody and he got custody from court of my daughter because court said if you are not Muslim and if you, the mother is not really religious how can she brought up her children in a way so I mean this is the big loss of my life How many years have you not seen your daughter? Uh, I remember uh, before four days it was 27th March and it was her ninth uh, birthday so from last five years, I didn't see her. I have no contact with her and uh, I am even not allowed to talk to her, to see her. I cannot. So from when she was four years old, then it was really last time when I have seen her and I, I just talked to her. Now, no. That's, as you say, the greatest price you've had to pay. Um, uh, but you carry on. How, does, how do you find the strength to carry on? Uh, look, Mariam, what I want, I want what I have suffered, what I have paid. I don't want any woman, especially the woman from Pakistan, because I know what is going on uh, in Pakistan with our women, with my women. They are my people. So they are suffering every day. And I don't want to let these things happen with them, with those women. So this is the reason, this is the strength, this is the courage I get every day. I talk to myself every day and I uh, assure myself every day that no, I have to speak up, I have to stand up. Not only for me, but for my people, my women, because they are also suffering. And I know it very well because I belong to that land. That is my country and I understand what is going to happen and what is happening still now and what is the current situation. So this gives me really courage and power to stand up and to speak up for the people who are suffering. 
Why did you start Atheist uh, Agnostic Alliance of Pakistan? Um, I started it in 2012. It was really a uh, first organization for atheists. Actually, uh, what I uh, seen that when I, uh, I had questions in my mind, there was no one to whom I can ask, I can share my thoughts, what is, uh, uh, yes, what is going on in my mind. So then I thought there must be any platform for Pakistani atheist people because I, I know, I knew that time also that there must be people who think like me, the like-minded people. So I thought there must be some platform. I googled it and I checked, I searched it many times but I didn't find. So I thought there must be a platform so I started with the help of Sayyid, my husband. So we both decided we will start a platform. It was really dangerous for us because in Islamic country you cannot do these kind of things. But we, yes, we did it. This is with your second husband. And tell us now about blasphemy laws in Pakistan. You're campaigning on behalf of uh, several people, including Ayaz Nizami. Tell us about the laws, its impact, and what's happening with Ayaz. Uh, in Pakistan, um, Pakistan is an uh, Islamic country. I already told many times on several platforms that 98% population is Muslim in Pakistan. It is really easy to accuse anyone in blasphemy law. When someone is not agree with you, not agree with your thought or with your point of view, you can accuse them in blasphemy law. I mean, you cannot ask any question over religion. If you have something in your mind that why Allah has written these things in the Quran, you cannot dare to ask questions. You cannot raise questions over Islam. So this is what is happening in Pakistan when people, because now most of the people, I know the uh, majority of Pakistani people, they are atheists now. They started to asking questions. But when they ask to someone, they accuse them in blasphemy law and they say, no, you are kafir. Why you are asking it? This is what Allah has said. And he said everything really uh, perfectly. And he has expressed everything really perfectly in the Quran. So this is what many people are in Pakistan. They are accusing them in blasphemy law. Someone if write anything, I mean, if not speak by spoken, but if they write anything on Facebook, they just book them in blasphemy law. Most of the people are suffering in this way. Their lives are on stake. People are running from their, uh, of, of for their lives. They are running to save them. Their families are also in trouble, but no one cares. They only want to save Islam, but they have no care and no responsibility for the human beings. I mean, th there is always a question in my mind, if Allah has promised to preserve or to care or to protect the Islam, then why Islam is always in danger? But I never found this question. I mean, always Islam is in danger. What I have seen in Islamic and Muslim countries, this is really funny, that Islam is always in danger. But even they believe, Muslims believe, Islamists believe that Allah has taken this responsibility to preserve, to, to save Islam. Then why they are fighting, they are killing over people with no reason, they are killing innocent people, they are accusing them in blasphemy law. And what happens in blasphemy law? No one will accept your case, no lawyer will come to you, nobody will ask you because they think, and this is true. Because in most of the cases, the lawyer are also killed by Islamists. No court accept your case because judges also uh, think about their lives. So this is really dangerous. So tell us about Ayaz Nizami and uh, what can be done about his case. What is his case? Uh, Ayaz Nizami is basically a religious scholar. <clears throat> and he is also a vice president of our organization, uh, AAAP. But uh, yes, he has taken by the authorities, FIA Pakistan, only because he was uh, writing some uh, contents. But, uh, but they, they say this is blasphemous content, but I don't believe because I always see him 
that he always asked question. He raised question over religion. And he searched, he read most of the books of Ahadith and Tafsir also. And he raised question and, and he asked why it is like this. I mean, why Allah has written this and why the other uh, uh, Islamists and Muftis and why they have ulama, they have uh, written it. And when people, they have no answer, the people who protect these uh, things, when they have no answer, they just accused him in blasphemy law. So this is what, I mean, he's such a religious scholar and now he's just suffering, he's, he's arrested by the authorities of Pakistan. This is really terrible. And what about Facebook's role? I mean, we hear that Facebook, uh, the government has asked Facebook to help it remove blasphemous content. Uh, you know, Facebook has removed almost 85% content, they say blasphemous content, from Facebook. They also have suspended my page, uh, at least in Agnostic Alliance Pakistan. They also have done uh, IHE uh, youth page and CMB page as well. So they are removing. I mean, Facebook is totally working for Pakistani authorities. Even Facebook says, no, this is the platform for express yourself and just you can come here, you can write your thoughts, you can express yourself. But it is not like this. Facebook is totally uh, working for Pakistan. They are helping them. So that's really disgusting, I mean. What do you think people can do to help ayahs and uh, free thinkers and uh, you know um, atheists in Pakistan? Uh, what I found, Madam, after arresting of uh, Junaid Hafiz, Asya Bibi, and now Ayaz Nizami, our people are really afraid. They are afraid. Even they have changed their names from Facebook. They have hired. Uh, uh, already, they have. Uh, uh, they were. Uh, Yes, leading the fake accounts, but now they are really afraid. And you can uh, you can think about it that it is really dangerous when someone can come in front of media or anyone, uh, uh, yeah, anyone authorities and can say that yes, I am in the favor of Ayaz Nizami. So it can be also dangerous for them. But now people are hiding because they are really uh, worried for their own lives. So what I want, I want the international organizations for human rights who are working, the CMB, IHU, and others also, CFI, I want to ask them that please stand up with us because over people are really afraid to talk about it. Most of the people are also threatening me in, in my account, Facebook account, and they are sending me messages, don't do this and you will be killed and whatever. But, you know, if everyone will be silenced, then how can we uh, say, how can we uh, convey our message to the world and how can we preserve our own human rights? So I want to ask for the help all organizations to put pressure on Pakistan because now I know this matter only can be solved by putting pressure on Pakistan and without it, it is not gonna possible. I know because Junaid Hafiz is suffering in prison from so many years and as well as Asya Bibi, but I don't want uh, uh, to, I asked Nizami suffered a lot in the name of Islam because we have already paid a lot in the shape of my life, you know, my daughter in the shape of uh, Asya Bibi and in the shape of Junaid Hafiz, but no more. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mariam. Alam al Hoda, who is the uh, representative of Ali Khamenei, Iran's supreme spiritual leader, he's come out with something really brilliant, which is obviously, you know, great and solves sane a major from their problem. point of solves view. A major solves problem. all the problems of universities. And he said, the problem with universities is that it teaches science and, sec you know, it's got a, a climate of secularity in it. The solution is that they become more like mosques. And the more like mosques that they are, the better off we'll all be. I don't think so. Get rid of the problem. So. Turn them into mosques hmm. and get everybody to wear the Mullah's outfit. That would be even better, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> I, I think we should take Jerry Seinfeld's role and become a comedian. Okay. So, so, yes, I mean, you know, stupid, stupid fatwa. Universities 
make them into mosques and then you don't have any problems with you people won't, you, you won't have any problems about secularism about atheism doubting you know science thinking <laughs> they don't like any of that you know it's a mosque i'll stand up front i'll be the supreme spiritual leader and you just listen to me and follow me universities where you're supposed to think and no we don't, we want, don't want that hey, what we want mosques more mosques is that what he says yes. no Universities should become mosques. Finished. That will solve the problem of the regime. I don't mm. think so. No. I don't think so. Stupid, stupid. He's got a big problem. Hmm. In April, in Kuwait City, Hadil Bukhraes coordinated a walking with her campaign where she organized a group of people to walk in support of Saudi women in their fight against male guardianship rules. This is solidarity, women's solidarity in the Middle East and particularly at the heart of um, Islamic ridden societies in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's so important. So we celebrate this uh, lovely moment of um, um, slice of life. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things we have to remember is that male guardianship rules have a real negative impact on people's lives. We just heard of a case of Dina Ali who fled to um, the Philippines. She was going to Australia to apply for asylum and she was dragged back home by her relatives given this male guardianship rules. So it's for lots of women that they're walking, including for uh, Dina Ali, uh, who we hope is, is safe. Yes. This brings us to the end of our program. Yes. Until we see you again at the same time and same place next week, have a wonderful few days. Goodbye. Goodbye. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon. 
empowering a new generation of content creators.